life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details. And survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello, everyone. Hello. Marshall and the Laney. And Laney is here. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a Cory. He did not sleep very well last night, but um, we're going to charge on ahead into the undead. This is going to be Season 2, Episode 3, Save the Last One. Yes. And uh, a little bit about this episode in particular... It first aired on AMC in the United States on October 30th, 2011, yeah, one day before Halloween. Ooh. Super fun. The episode was written by Scott M. Gimple and directed by Phil Abraham. It was viewed by 6.095 million viewers. The episode was the highest rated program of the day, garnering considerably higher rating, ratings then a stock car racing event as part of the 2011 NASCAR Sprint Cup series on ESPN and the next Iron Chef on Food Network. People would rather see, you know, guts and gore than uh, guts and gore of a car or people cooking. Apparently so. So we open in this episode on Herschel's farm and uh, the shower is running. Mm -hmm. There's a picture on the wall that says... Wherever you wander, wherever you roam, be happy and healthy and glad to come home. I, I feel like that's just... It's almost insidious how happy it is. <laughs> how, how warm and happy this thing is. It just... Given what goes on in this series... Yeah, that's very true. Shane is cutting his hair, and from everything that I could find... He is really cutting his hair mm -hmm. in this scene. There is something interesting that I found about Shane's hair and John Bernthal's relationship to his hair. If you notice before, even before and after he cuts his hair in the scene, he touches his hair. Um, and it, he has said that his character, Shane, can't keep his hands off his head. He says, I've tried to find mannerisms for him, especially this season. He has things he does when he gets nervous or agitated. Shane is constantly boiling and constantly at war with himself. And I think that these gestures and movements come out of what's going on inside of him. This is very much like a, an actor mechanism. Um, I actually went to college with a guy that we... Uh, acted in in theater plays together and he had this one move that he did for this particular character that i will always remember where he curls a piece of his hair around his finger to help get him back into character so mm. that that's really i, I kind of connected with what he was saying here as far as making shane do these mannerisms it, it's a mnemonic it's something you're using to get into their mindset after we have seen him cut his hair this particular episode really jumps back and forth kind of in the past in the present and then in all the different locations that are that are happening it and so it might be a little tricky to follow along but we'll do our best to tell you where we are at each thing and we had noticed at the end of season one episode six was filmed with a lot of kind of this feeling of lost and i get that even more with this episode because of all the time jumping we're in at fema and if you remember from the episode before shane and otis are trying to get medical supplies for carl so that they can perform surgery and uh, they have been trapped inside the main building at the fema location they are running through the building in this scene and as they're running through the building, you can hear a voiceover of Rick narrating how Shane stole a principal's car. So basically it was to comfort Lori that if Shane can make it out of this you know, predicament with, a, with the principal's car and, and be able to run as fast as he can, he can get out of the situation in order to get... Yeah, because basically he ended up hot wiring and stealing the car, driving it to a remote location, running three miles, and still have time to finish his lunch. Mm -hmm. So nobody could suspect that he did anything. Yes. 
Right around here, there is a deleted scene where Otis and Shane are in a cafeteria. It looks like kind of a cafeteria thing. It wasn't a very important scene, which is probably why it got deleted, but it yeah. was just them talking. Now we're back at the farm, and Rick is with Lori and Carl and telling them the rest of the story about uh, Shane and his running. And one of the things that's going on is that Lori is trying to get Rick to eat because he's been giving a lot of blood. That means that you know he's he's low on calories, he's low on nutrients because he doesn't have it. And he picks up what looks to be some sort of turkey sandwich on Wonder Bread, some sort of you know processed white bread. And I, I feel like this sandwich is defying all odds. As this has been more than a month since the apocalypse. Um, Store-bought bread will keep in the fridge for up to 12 days before it's starting to go stale. Um, and then it still has a possibility of getting mold no matter where you're keeping it. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it came from a freezer, it should be it should still be used up at this point. So what's really weird is that this is this is definitely store-bought bread, but it's totally fine month or more out. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little lesson for the apocalypse. Learn to make bread. Uh, well, yes, you can do that. Especially because I can say from our own experience of making bread, I bought a ton of flour in bulk and kept it in a tub, an airtight tub in our garage. It's still good. It We're still able to use it uh, even a year later. At the yeast, though, uh, you can get like a package, I don't know, like a pound of yeast and keep it in your fridge. It will stay good, but it may not be as potent as you uh, hope it is for like a a bread. So it really Mm -hmm. depends on which bread you make. The best scenario is to make a sourdough starter and try to keep feeding it. But if you live in a very humid area like we do, it's very hard to keep that sourdough starter. That's why you need to keep it in the fridge also. But I, if I remember correctly, you do need to feed it uh, a little yeast every day. I'm not sure if that's true. Um, if you're really big into sourdough and whatnot, please let me know. It's been a while since I've tried to feed the starter. I, it might be that you just feed the feed it with flour and that's it. So maybe sourdough is the way to go. Yeah, I, I think so. Some sort of bread that that ferments over time, gives Mm -hmm. the yeast somewhere to grow into. We are back at the RV, and Carol is crying. Daryl can't sleep. Andrea's fiddling with her gun again. So Daryl and Andrea decide to go looking for Sophia. I'm just wondering, where did she get the gun? Because Dale has the gun at this point. She's sitting there cleaning the gun, but she doesn't have a gun to clean. I don't remember. He does give it back to her at some point. Yeah. But this is not it. Very good catch. Very good catch. Dale and Andrea go looking for Sophia again. And when they leave, like, Dale comes up and he's like, is that really a good idea for you guys to go out searching at night? And Andrea just like, Dale. And it's like she's saying, shut up. I'm doing what I want. Because what? This guy made a choice for you so now you have a free pass to be stupid and not even listen to what he's saying (laughs) like i i think i i dislike how she's acting right now it's it's so i kind of agree with that yes yeah we are back at fema they're up on this like it looks like bleachers that have been pushed back into the wall or or something i know our gym had that kind of situation yeah where if you could climb up there you could walk all along one wall on the very, very, very top bleacher. Shane lays down some cover fire and Otis tries to distract them so that Shane can go jump into a window area. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm noting in here is that you you see a lot of these zombies uh, are wearing army fatigues. They seem to be from the FEMA workers, military workers that are there for security. And one of those soldier zombies has their legs amputated, Hmm. suggesting that even at this point, somebody has figured out that they can save a bite victim by amputating before any toxins reach the rest of their bloodstream. So was this in like a soldier fatigues? Is that how you could tell it was a soldier? Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, they were one, they were crawling along with soldier fatigues and they had bandages on the, on where their legs were cut off. Okay. Shane gets to the windows. He breaks the windows, drops the bag. The guns fall down a couple stories, 
And then he tries to jump out, but the walker grabs him from his legs. So he shoots the walker and then falls on his back to the ground. You can hear more gunshots, probably from Otis on the inside of the gym. Mm -hmm. And now the farm. Glenn and T-Dog arrive at the farm. And Maggie is the first one out, welcomes them all in. Mm -hmm. And then Glenn is like, you can tell by the way that he's stammering while talking to her. He's just like, you are amazing. (laughs) Like That's running through his head. He just wants to tell her she's the most incredible woman he's ever met. Mm -hmm. Zorro on a horse. So I really have to point out here that T-Dog is delirious, feverish, probably in pain and bleeding. But the first thing he does is not, hey, take care of my arm. The first thing he does is he goes in with Glenn to go see how Rick and Lori and Carl are doing. I I don't think it really occurred to me at the time that I was watching this, but it cur- occurred to me now how significant that is. That yeah. the two of them decided to go in there and just be like, how are you guys doing, really? Like, they truly are part of that family, you know? And the dichotomy of them versus how Shane and Andrea reacts in this situation is is kind of sad. Yeah. Um, I think also when Maggie sees them come in the room, she really is softened by them and understanding the type of people that these people are. That they can band together with each other. They must not be as worrisome as they've seen other people be in their lives. People who try to take advantage of them and of the farm. Um, And so when Glenn comes back out through the door, she actually puts her hand on Glenn's back to kind of guide him back in out of the room. It's really cute. And then Herschel says the time to make a decision is drawing near. They're going to have to do surgery if they want Carl to survive. And even then he might not survive because they're taking too long at FEMA. Yeah. And they don't have the respirator that he needs or any of the other things in order to prevent nicking the wrong arteries. This is, this, this, this could get really bad really fast. Mm-hmm. Back at the RV, Daryl and Andrea are searching. Uh, they're walking around. But Daryl is still very positive about finding Sophia. Nobody else is very positive about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he seems to be uplifting people with with the hope of finding Sophia again, which is, I don't know, I, I still marvel at the fact that Daryl is the one who does this. And he relays to Andrea his story of being lost in the woods while Merle is in juvie. Mm-hmm. And I think that might be really interesting because he is now taking his own tenacity and saying that Sophia might have that same tenacity, that right. same survival instinct to continue going through the fear. Yeah, she has been through a lot at such a young age. I feel like she would be a fighter, too, if given the chance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the farm, Lori and Rick are on the porch, and they have this entire conversation about would it be a bad thing if Carl died? Because children in this world might not be... Great. I have to think that at this point, and we don't know this for sure, if you're watching the show for the first time, you don't know this, but we know this, that she is pregnant at this point. So not only is she dealing with the horrors of the world and her child, but the fact that she's probably very hormonal when it comes to her feelings and emotions because of the fact that she's pregnant. And I don't know if she suspects it yet, But she's probably thinking in the back of her head, why would we be bringing yet another child into this world? Look what happened in my first one. Yeah. But at the same time, I feel like she doesn't know Carl's nature at this point. Because she's saying that he's just going to become this feral surviving animal. And we do go on to see in the rest of the series... Carl disproves all of these fears. He becomes the voice of hope and sympathy during the Savior War arc. And he gains the respect of both allies and enemies just for his bravery and his humanity. Mm -hmm. It's just he's such a strong person and human being that nothing, even the zombies, can stop that. Although that doesn't really mean to say that he is the strong person all the time. There is a time where he falters and he acts 
his age, really, uh, like you would expect someone of his age to act. But I think overall, in general, he is he has that strong core and that strong foundation. Even someone with a strong foundation is going to have moments where they need to break and rest. Right, of course. Um, and near the end of this, uh, they're really talking about how Jenner is talking about opting out. And Rick is telling her it doesn't matter what he says, but he stumbles while he's saying it. Because his brain remembers the last thing that Jenner said to him. Mm, very true. And he's like, I'm thinking about Jenner opting out. And then he remembers the whispered warning. And he's like, that doesn't matter either. At FEMA, Shane is trying to get around the walkers outside. And he is using guns, which makes so much noise. It makes the other ones come running. So why is he not using the axe, Shane, or the or the knife? Like, why is he using the guns and then being like, why are they coming after us? There's so many of them. Well, <laughs> you're making so much noise. Yeah, exactly. The next thing that happens here is something that I would like to compare to the deer and Carl. There's a scene where Shane is standing there and there's a walker coming out of him dead on, like... The, the walker is right in front of him. Otis shoots this walker and Otis is a little ways away, but shoots the walker dead on in a straight line. Let me, let me reiterate this again. In a straight line is Otis, the walker, and then Shane. So in theory, should this bullet not go through the walker and hit Shane? Oh, this is now video game rules. The bullet has despawned inside the zombie's head after the kill shot. I, I saw the same thing. I'm like, wait, then shouldn't Shane be dead? Shouldn't Shane have like one eye out or something? Because that's a thing in this. Show. I mean, I know there's a lot of bone in the in the brain skull, but what what? I, I also feel like if they're gonna have this thing where it's super simple to stab into a zombie's head, then these bullets should just pass through. Yeah. Especially because of all the rotting and... Well, the rotting is not actually a thing. These jelly skulls that the zombies seem to have is just for the show. uh, Just to make it easier for the characters to Mm -hmm. survive. In reality, jelly skull is not going to happen. Okay. (laughs) At the farm, Carl is waking up now. And the first thing he talks about is the pain. Yeah, he's in pain. And then he talks about the deer. And the look on his on his face again, the joy of remembering seeing the deer, and then he goes into a seizure. And he needs more blood, but uh, Rick really can't give more blood, because he's probably given two transfusions already, and he looks like he's about to pass out himself. Yeah, and Herschel goes, I, I take much more. You could go into a coma. And Rick should have been like, uh, been there, done that, last week. <laughs> right. <laughs> this family has gone through this much in a week. That is so true. I mean, they he and his son, you know, both have the same injuries and passing out. And, yeah, that's very true. At FEMA, Otis is starting to get a little winded. And Shane has a hurt leg, which I think is from when he, like, jumped out of the window, yeah. right? But they are both kind of, like, struggling to make it to the vehicle. Neither are really looking around. Because while they're struggling to get to the vehicle they kind of come around a corner and then they just lean up against the fence without looking because yeah. immediately there's zombies right there they could have been nipped mm. they, they could have had a love nibble true and that that would have been it for either one of them true that is so true so that that's just how bad off they are they're not paying any attention Back at the RV, Dale is smoking cigarettes, I think. And there is a deleted scene uh, somewhere in here. I I tried to figure out where it would go. It might have gone before this scene, but I'm, I'll go ahead and talk about it here. Um, so there's this deleted scene where Dale uh, gets into a car and he's smoking cigarettes. I think he found them in the car. I'm not sure. And They he, may have been the ones that T-Dog found. It, they could have been. Uh, He turns on the car. There's like a tape or a recording in the car that someone was listening to when the car stopped. And it was this religious recording about God. And like, I couldn't hear all of it because number one, there was no captioning on this deleted scene. And number two, it was just hard to hear. 
But basically, Dale is just listening to it like incredulous, incredulously about the whole thing. He said that God told them that if he ever ran into that religious speaker, he would shove the microphone up his butt and I quote, his will be done. Um, I would just thought was funny. I know I'm not like totally telling this correctly because there's some stuff I was missing, but I just thought it was really funny that <laughs> Dale was like, you got to be kidding me, religious speaker. This I don't know what it was. Dale and Carol are deciding to keep watch, and Daryl and Andrea are still in the woods. They hear a noise, and they come across a tent. Not the same tent as before. Completely different tent. There is a zombie hanging from the trees with a note that is pinned to him that says, Got bit. Fever hit. World gone to... You get the, you get the rhyme. Might as well quit. And I'm going to bring up that before dying, this guy had some really nice handwriting that was very clear. Yeah, it was. Especially because at the point that he's talking about fever hit, uh, he should be delirious. How is he writing straight? But as we know in the pandemic, the fever is just an indication that you're getting sick. Yeah. So he might have gotten sick before getting delirious. You know, even T-Dog has a little bit of fever and he can still think straight yeah so this zombie has a fishing vest on it looks like daryl asks if andrea wants to live now and she says she will give him an answer for an arrow then she goes ahead and shoots the zombie well she she asks she asks she asks for it she, she gives the answer and then he shoots her answer is, I don't know if I want to live, or if I have to, or if it's just a habit. Yeah, that's deep, Andrea. <laughs> she's basically admitting that she's trying to process it, at least. Yeah. That she's not, she's no longer just trying to die. She's trying to figure out if she wants to live. Right. And then Daryl says that that was like a waste of an arrow. <laughs> yeah, because it wasn't really an answer. But the way that she's looking at this zombie, I'm seeing... A little bit of uh, sympathy, maybe identification, because she herself wanted to opt out, and because she couldn't, she's lashing out at everybody around her. And here she sees this zombie hanging by its neck, lashing out at them completely futilely. There's no point to its existence anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's almost like what she is right now, which is maybe why she wants to put it out of its misery. Dale goes wandering and leaves Carol to watch, but Carol doesn't know how to use a gun. Yeah. Yet, uh, which I'm pretty sure is because her husband was a jerk and didn't want them to figure out ways to protect themselves. So that's why Dale just walks off with the gun. Yeah. At the farm, Patricia is sewing up T-Dog, and there was a great quote because they're talking about all the different pain relievers and stuff that that he's on and where they got it. And she says, I'd say Merle Dixon's clap was the best thing that ever happened to you. <laughs> you don't really want to think of it that way, but you're, mm, yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> and Glenn's really not too happy at the sight of all the stitching and goriness. So he goes to the porch. And then Maggie comes up at, on him because he's praying. So she comes up and he doesn't recognize her coming. He's like, <gasps> Why do you always sneak up on people? And she's like, well, it's easy. He's easy to sneak up on. It's because he's not being aware. This happens to me all the time at work. Mm -hmm. I walk completely normal with fan around my neck. So I'm making noise everywhere I go. And people are like, oh my gosh, why did you scare me? I'm just here. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <sighs> Glenn says it's his first time praying. And then they have this whole conversation about how prayers go unanswered and, like, do they believe in prayer, etc. And Maggie says to him that you have to make it right for yourself. And not only is she wise in this moment, but she is also understanding mm -hmm. of what he has to do. In, in so much as, you know, she stays on the porch with him a little bit and then, you know, leaves and lets him do what he needs to do. Uh, I, I feel like a lot of people would kind of push their agenda on other people in this situation, but she doesn't. Yeah, because she also says, I don't want to get in the way of you believing in God. Mm -hmm. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Exactly. Yeah. And the next shot is back at the RV where Dale is just wandering around. And uh, why? 
Yeah, this shot has absolutely no purpose. It's, it's just him. And he doesn't find anything. He's just walking. I don't get it. I don't get mm. the shot at all. <laughs> let's cut down this episode and get rid of that chalk. Anyway, so let's just pretend we're still on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Rick tells Lori about the deer. Because apparently in everything that has happened, they have never been able to have the discussion about what happened two minutes before Carl gets shot. It was literally, Carl gets shot, what are we going to do about it? But they've, they've been sitting around giving blood for, like, hours. Or sitting in silence, as many of the scenes show them doing. I honestly can't believe they haven't had this discussion before then. But they finally do. And he he keeps saying... You know, we had this whole discussion about kids and where does kids belong in this world. But look, Carl woke up talking about something beautiful and something that lives and something that makes life worth living. These little moments that that you don't really think about when you're in the midst of all this trauma. That's what makes it worth it. Not thinking about the fact that everything is death. At FEMA, Shane is having trouble... Uh, getting around because of his hurt leg and Otis won't leave Shane behind. Yeah, he, he's... I, I actually like Otis here because, I mean, we see what's going on later. The Otis just keeps on proving that he's the better person. Mm-hmm. Like, through and through. But then they kind of talk about how many shots that they have between them. Otis has four shots and Shane has a total of six. And so between the two of them, they have 10 shots. And behind them is a crowd of 50 walkers. Why are you even bothering to shoot? Mm -hmm. Just keep going. Yeah. Because nothing is going to affect any of what you're doing. You can just save the bullets for another day. Yeah, If you have another day. Or yourself, if you don't make it. Honestly, what what does it matter about the zombies behind them? They're far enough behind them. It's not an issue. Just keep going towards the thing. Take out the ones in front of you. I, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay. At the farm, we have reached a decision time. Herschel says it's time to make a choice. If they, if you don't do this now, Carl, will definitely die. So they decide that they are going to have surgery. They move Carl to this metal operating table. And just as they're about to do this, they hear the truck. And in the truck is Shane with no Otis. And this whole scene... Shane's eyes are screaming, how am I going to spin this? There is something that has happened, and he doesn't want to tell anybody. Correct. Yes. So Shane says that Otis was going to cover him, and he would keep going, meaning Shane would keep going, and then he implied that Otis got caught. And in the background, you can see Lori kind of comforting Maggie, which I think is... I, I, like, that's just... Um, how should I say this? Lori is very motherly yeah, in a lot of ways. And she tends to connect to the other women in the party in that way. So even though she doesn't know Maggie very well, her going to comfort her was very cool. Yeah. At the RV, Dale returned... Uh, Dale's already returned. Dale, Dale has returned, yes. <laughs> Uh, again, why did he go out? We don't know. Carol is upset because Daryl and Andrea have come back without Sophia. So again, <laughs> Sophia's not out there. <laughs> she's, she's upset about it. Dale then returns Andrea's gun. Here it is. This mm-hmm. is where he actually does it. So why was she cleaning the gun? I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, he apologizes about uh, the whole situation then Andrea decides she's going to take watch, and she tries to forgive Dale for what has happened. Yeah, I mean, he's kind of like, oh, you forgive me? Do you forgive me? Do you forgive me? And she's like, I'm trying. When we go back to the farm, Maggie is mourning Otis, and Glenn asks Maggie who else she has lost. So we've already kind of had this conversation with Rick and Herschel, where Rick asks Herschel who he lost where he says, you know, used to have my wife and my stepson and we don't have it anymore, have them anymore. Uh, Maggie says besides Otis, she lost her mom, she lost her stepmom and her stepbrother. So that was an additional person that we didn't realize. So Herschel's actually lost two wives, really, in his life. Uh, 
at this point, it re- occurred to me that I haven't really seen Beth or her boyfriend at all. Yeah. Except for that first time when they come out on the porch. What What are they doing? And, and even in the next episode, like, from what I've seen, like, her boyfriend only shows up for blips. Which I'm pretty certain is the uh, editorial equivalent of a red shirt. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I can I can barely remember his name, so who knows? Yeah, he's just the boyfriend. The other thing that happens is when she was telling Glenn about she has to reconcile it with herself or you have to reconcile it with yourself to make it right. It occurred to me also in this moment that she might have been talking about the barn. Mm -hmm. Because I think she does, if I remember correctly, we aren't there yet, but but I think she does know what is happening with the barn. And therefore, she has to make it right within herself of what they're doing in the barn. Herschel comes in and tells everyone that Carl seems to have stabilized. And then Rick goes up and he gives Herschel a hug. And I can see that watch. It says 1156. So in this this case, from the last episode when we were talking about how it said 202 because it was episode 202. In this case, no, it does not. So I think they're still getting onto that... They're, they're getting on episode meantime. Right. So if you don't know what we're talking about, a lot of the set designers and set dressers would have said that they would set the clocks to whatever episode number it was. So technically his watch should say 203, but it doesn't. So but also in other episodes, if they're doing a flashback to something that occurs during another episode, the watch will show you the episode in which this scene occurs. Right. So you get you can look really closely and figure out where in the timeline you are. Right, exactly. So when Shane first came in, they didn't want to tell Patricia about Otis, but they do now. So sh- as they do, Shane comes in and sees Patricia crying and then goes in to see Carl. I, I almost hope that Shane feels a tiny bit of guilt about what he had to do to Patricia's husband. I wish. I don't know if he does. I think he does. And that's a lot of what's driving him right Right. now. Lori kind of forgives Shane about things because he saved Carl's life and asks him to stay. Meaning, please don't leave the group. Maggie gives Shane some clothes, which he says were Otis's. Uh, I was trying to see, but we don't see after the shower. But I would really like to see these clothes on Shane. Because Otis is a big guy. Uh, I think we do, in the next episode, see it, and it is comically large. (laughs) Comically large. And Maggie tells Shane where he can go shower. And now we're back at the shower scene, and in this scene, we are not only watching Shane take a shower, but we're also looking at the FEMA, what happened to Otis. So this is what happens. Otis and Shane are running and shooting. And they are both down to their last bullet. Shane uses his last bullet to shoot Otis. In the knee. In the knee, right. What I would like to bring up here is what Kirkman has said about this whole situation. So Kirkman expressed that the death of Otis was a somewhat justifiable homicide and retorted that Otis was slowing him down and Carl's life hangs in the balance. I call foul on this because I feel like we should get t-shirts made that say I call foul. I call foul, Shane. (laughs) Um, I call foul on this because, number one, Shane was limping. Uh, Otis was wheezing, yes, but he was only a little slow. But he was the one in front of Shane Yeah, I was noting like he was continuously moving faster than Shane and then stopping for him. Yeah, it... I, I don't believe this is justifiable homicide at all. And we will be adding this to the the very first person as the we don't kill live people list. Because even though Shane doesn't directly kill Otis, he is responsible for his death because he shot him with the intention of killing him via zombie. Yes. He was sacrificing him. And I think he's sacrificing not only to save himself, but to get credit for saving Carl. Correct. So, yes, Shane, congratulations. You are number one on the we don't kill living people list. And he also takes extra time to take not only the pack, but to get the Colt Python back. 
Right. He does. He's trying to get Rick's gun back because he thinks Rick will be appreciative of that. So sneaky. So he takes extra time to wrestle the gun away from him. But then as they're doing that, you can hear one more gunshot from Otis's gun. So now there's no bullets. No Mm -hmm. bullets at all left. And then you're back at the shower. And I think the haircut symbolizes Shane has finally finished his transformation of monster villain entity. And I think that this, like, him shaving his head is, like, cutting away all this fluffy overgrowth, revealing the selfish Machiavellian soldier type character that he has within him. Uh He is getting rid of everything that was a mask. All the things that he's running his hands through his hair because, man, living like this is just, ah, uh, ah. Uh, and now that's gone and he's going to be whatever he wants to be. Mm-hmm. Because now he knows he can be a hero by being a villain. <laughs> um, ironically, this is even less hair than when John Bernthal played as the Punisher. I'm not surprised. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was a straight, all the hair is gone. Yeah. So a few extra things for this episode. There was no notable music that I could find and no one with a the name. What else are we tracking? Are we tracking Andrea's gun? Which she has not fired yet. Right. So we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Anything else we're tracking? No, I, I don't think anything else trackable was in here. So as far as the comic thing, uh, the comic connection to all of this goes, a lot of the things that happen going forward in the comics are things that happen in later episodes. So there isn't really a lot to talk about, especially because a lot of it is overlap from the last episode. So we, yeah. don't, we don't really need to talk this about it This is primarily just wrapping up those comic threads of Carl getting shot. Right, exactly. So next week we're going to talk about ep- season two, episode four, Cherokee Rose. This is going to be a good one, I think. It is. All right. See you guys then. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes, and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Lainey on at Zany Lainey or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time, Geek Out.